Coping with Stress, brought to you by Purdue University Extension. My name is Joe Gilreath, and I am a Health and Human Sciences educator with Purdue Extension in Warwick County. Our educational programs focus on issues related to food, family, money, and health. We bring research-based information to you to help make your life better. My background is in mental health and my specialty area is health and wellness. This presentation includes practical tips for coping with everyday stress. The material is intended for informational purposes only, not to be a substitute for proper medical care, including assessment, diagnosis, and treatment. I'm going to make some references to you creating an action plan. So get out a pad of paper, your note app on your phone, or pull up a Word document so you can jot down your ideas. And while you're at it, jot down my contact information in case you have questions later. Please note that Purdue University is an equal opportunity, equal access, affirmative action institution. If you need this program in an alternative format, just contact me directly so I can provide an accommodation. I am excited to have you with me, along with others who have watched and will watch in the future. Together, we are embracing our stress and learning to improve our lives. Here we go. As we start, I'd like to suggest that you remove any possible distractions for the next half hour. Silence your cell phone, shut your door, dim the lights, lower your blinds. Just get ready to focus on the information and yourself. To start, ask yourself, how stressed do I feel on a scale of 1 to 10? Now let's do a simple breathing exercise to help us get centered and focused. You can close your eyes or keep them open. Sit upright in your chair with your feet uncrossed and flat on the floor. Place your hands comfortably at your sides or in your lap. Now take a deep inhale to the count of three. Then exhale to the count of three. Inhale deeper to the count of four. And slowly exhale to the count of four. Inhale again, filling up your abdomen. Then exhale slowly, releasing all of the air. Repeat at your own pace for two more breaths. And start to bring your focus back to the room. Open your eyes if they were closed. Now ask yourself, how stressed do I feel now? My hope is you went down a notch. Who is experiencing stress? When you are out and about, do you see people looking like this? Maybe you've looked like this at times. Well, these photos reflect people who are experiencing stress, men, women, children. Since the start of the COVID pandemic, Mental Health America reports that they have seen a two to three times increase in the number of people self-reporting symptoms of depression and anxiety. And the severity that they are reporting of symptoms has been higher. It is important to be paying attention to your stress, your mental health, it is time to put perfectionism to the side and be realistic, open, and honest about how you are thinking, feeling, and doing. It's why I so appreciate you taking the time to watch this presentation and learn more. Often people will ask, what is the difference between stress and a mental health disorder or illness? You might wonder, well, if I'm stressed, does that mean I have a mental health condition? How do I know if it, I'm okay or not okay? Is this something I should be concerned about? Well, to better understand what you are experiencing, pay attention to signs and symptoms related to your stress. 
Ones that could be a sign of possible mental health condition include feeling hopeless, having social withdrawal, mood changes, unexpected weight loss, appetite changes, trouble focusing, sleep issues, no longer enjoying activities that you previously enjoyed, extreme worry, physical pain, or illness. Now, we all experience some of the things on that lap list at some time to some degree. Think of the signs and symptoms as being on a continuum. They can range on a scale of 1 to 10. They can go up and down. Know what your normal or your usual is and then gauge how much you are deviating from that. If you are wondering, should I seek professional help? Think about the nature of your symptoms. Are they on the upper end of that scale? Are they negatively affecting how you function? Do they interfere in your ability to do your daily activities? Are they unusual or lasting longer than normal? If so, it may be time to ask for help and seek some guidance, but that's okay. Know this fact, one in five Americans will have a mental health condition at some time in their life. One in five. It is common and not unusual. Good resources for obtaining help include contacting your local health care provider, checking with your insurance carrier, or a possible employee assistance program. You can also look to reputable national organizations such as Mental Health America, SAMHSA, and Be Well Indiana. At the end of the video, resources will be listed. There is no one specific cause of stress, and it varies person to person. In general, root causes of stress can include finances, relationship strain, injury, disease, disability, fear of the unknown, social unrest, social isolation, discrimination, worry about children, parents, and family, the pandemic, and that all-inclusive category of other. But stop and ask yourself, what stresses me? Then take it a step further and ask, which of these stressors do I have control over? If you cannot control the actual stressor, remember you can control how you react to it. Is all stress bad? Well, yes and no. In the short term, stress can help you stay alert and give you energy and motivation to complete a task. But chronic excessive stress is bad for your health. It can weigh you down emotionally and physically. The challenge is to keep the stress in the good range and not let it result in that bad range of exhaustion, panic, burnout, or illness. This chart shows the various organs and systems within your body where signs of chronic stress can appear. Stress can affect emotions, mood, and behavior as well as the following systems, nervous system, cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, respiratory, reproductive, and the endocrine system. How can you or somebody else tell that you are stressed? What do you feel, think, do? Differentiating the feelings, thoughts, and behaviors can be difficult at first, but with practice, you will find that it makes more sense and it increases your awareness. So always be asking yourself, what am I feeling, thinking, and doing? What should you do to prevent the good stress from turning into bad stress? Use coping tools, coping skills. Now, not all coping tools are equal. Some work better than others. What works for one person might not work for you. And some coping techniques can actually make things worse, such as overeating, turning to alcohol, drugs, or medications to mask feelings, drowning yourself in TV or social media binges, socially withdrawing, or isolating yourself. In a carpenter's analogy, a bad coping tool would result in bent and broken nails, making your job, your day, harder. But a tool that works for you, that fits your needs, will allow you to hit the nail on the head and hammer it straight in. 
it takes time to build up the positive coping skills and redirect the not so helpful ones. Let's take a look at what you can do. Self-care is the umbrella term for taking care of yourself. Self-care seems to be a hot word these days, but it's because generally speaking, we don't do enough of it and it does matter. People may balk at the idea of self-care because the concept seems selfish, cheesy, or undoable, but in our current reality of the COVID pandemic, some healthy routines you had previously established for yourself may have gone to the wayside. It is time to take control and get back to balance. If you think you can't make time for self-care or that it's not important, remember the airplane oxygen mask analogy. If the oxygen masks deploy, you must put your mask on first before helping a child or someone else. If you cannot keep yourself healthy, you are no help to others. Self-care boils down to this short list. Own your feelings, let go, practice healthful eating, get some exercise, be active, have positive self-talk, get some personal time, and have social connections. Lucky seven. You've heard these before because it's well known that they do make a difference. Let's look at each one. Own your feelings. In order to manage overwhelming feelings, you should allow yourself to feel them. Ignoring them does not make them go away. The cliche of, if I let things bottle up, they will explode is absolutely true and it is not healthy. By suppressing negative emotions, you can also inadvertently alter your ability to feel positive emotions. Basically, if you bury one, you bury the other. Practice naming your feelings. You might feel bad, but what do you really feel? What's causing that bad feeling? You might feel angry, but underneath, Maybe it's really fear or guilt that's driving the anger. Most of us identify with the basic emotions of mad, glad, sad, but we all know it's not that simple. There are many, many emotions. This wheel has lots of words on it, which you probably can't read unless you zoom in, but each word represents a different emotion, a different layer of an emotion. Talk about your feelings. Find a trusted adult, someone who can give you feedback or just listen. Tell them what you need. It can be a family member, friend, pastor, mentor, or coworker. Or you can consider contacting a trained professional such as a healthcare provider, counselor, or therapist. It is okay to ask for help. It is a tool, not a crutch. Write about them. Journaling is a safe way to sort through what you are feeling. You might be surprised how putting pen to paper helps you process your thoughts and your feelings. It can be done anywhere at any time, and it can be only for your eyes. After owning your feelings, you will want to practice letting go, which can include mindfulness activities such as deep breathing, relaxation exercises, meditation, yoga. It can be as simple as closing your eyes, visualize something that makes you feel good, take five deep breaths and say to yourself, I am letting it go. This phrase on the screen never gets old and it is so true, so put it somewhere. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And now is a good time for me to remind you about your action plan. Are you taking some notes? What has sounded of interest? What will you try? Self-care tip number three, healthful eating. You are what you eat. And when you put healthful eating practices in place, you're more likely to get proper nutrition. Healthy eating styles do not have to be rigid plans. They can be adapted to include foods that you enjoy and that meet your personal and cultural preferences. The key is to find an eating plan that fits your lifestyle and start by making small changes that can add up to big success over time. 
Focus on following the MyPlate guidelines. There are five groups on your plate, vegetables, fruits, grains, protein, and dairy. Half of your plate should be fruits and vegetables, half, followed by a fourth of grains and a fourth of protein and a small serving of dairy on the side. Focus on eating whole fruits, vary your veggies, vary your proteins, make half your grains whole grains. If you consume dairy, move to low fat, milk, yogurts, and cheese, and drink water instead of sugary drinks. Healthful eating will provide you steady, stable energy as opposed to the energy high crash cycle we find with the highly processed and sugary foods. For more information, visit choosemyplate.gov. And don't forget this simple tip. Remember to eat regularly. There is a legit condition called hangry, a state of emotional distress caused by dramatic hunger. A lack of food results in a bad temper. So hunger can actually cause a negative change in your emotional state. Prep healthful snacks and seek out healthful meals to prevent becoming hangry. Coping tool number four. You knew it was coming. Exercise. It is well known that exercise is good for us. And if you have a love-hate relationship with exercise, then I encourage you to focus on the phrase, be active. And could you add a little more physical activity into your day? Physical activity can help your body filter out stress hormones. It can calm you down, produce beneficial hormones and brain chemicals that boost the mood and make you feel more even keel. It can improve sleep, which in turn improves your mood. It factors into disease prevention and improved quality of life. All these good consequences. So why do only 44% of the adults in Indiana get the recommended amount of at least 150 minutes of moderate to intense physical activity each week? Well, when we are feeling down, it can be hard to get motivated to exercise. Our busy schedules, full plates, and never-ending to-do lists get in the way, and COVID has not helped. But with conscious planning, you can increase your physical activity. Let me show you right now. Let's do a few simple exercises that can be done anytime, anywhere. Start with our ankles, sit securely in your chair, and stretch your legs out in front of you. Heels on the floor, Bend your ankles and flex your toes up towards you. Hold for five seconds. Then bend your ankles and point your toes away from you. Hold for five seconds. Then repeat. Flex. Hold. Point. Repeat. And normally I'd say to do this 10 to 15 times, but right now we'll just do three. If you're feeling strong, you can lift your heels off the floor and point, hold, flex, hold. Don't stop there, let's add some circles. Circle both feet to the right three times. And circle to the left three times. Now we're gonna stand up behind your chair. If you prefer to remain seated, you can do these seated. This is the toe stand. Place your feet shoulder width apart, holding it onto the chair for balance, and slowly stand up on your tiptoes as high as possible. Hold for five seconds. Then slowly lower your heels to the floor. Repeat this three times. Stand up on your tippy toes, hold, and slowly lower. Repeat. Now we're gonna move on to our thighs. Stand with your feet shoulder width apart, knees straight, not locked. Hold on to the chair for balance with your right hand, bend your left leg back, 
and grab your foot in your left hand. Keep your knee pointed to the floor and gently pull your leg until you feel a stretch in your thigh. Hold for five seconds. Then lower your foot. Lift again and repeat three times. Now we're gonna switch legs and grab our right leg with our right hand, point the knee to the floor. Gently pull and stretch your right leg for five seconds. Put your leg down. Lift again and repeat. Finally, we're gonna to move to the overhead arm raise. Stay standing, bend your elbows, and hold your hands at shoulder height like a goalpost with your palms facing forward. Slowly raise both arms up over your head, keeping your elbows slightly bent. Hold for a couple seconds, then slowly lower your arms. Repeat a few more times up over your head, lower, one more time. And now we're all done. Do you feel a little more energized? Do you feel your blood flowing? Well, little bursts of physical activity like this throughout the day can be a part of being active. It doesn't matter so much what you do as long as you are doing something. So pick an activity you enjoy, something you can stick with, and maybe consider doing it with a friend or an accountability buddy. You can start small with a simple walk every day. Just get moving. Since this topic is a whole presentation in itself, for additional information, you can check out our videos on Get Moving, Do Some Walking, and Be Active Every Day. On to coping tool number five, positive self-talk. You can be your own worst critic, so be careful how you talk to yourself you are listening. Cycles of negative thoughts and damaging self-talk can forge negative connections in our brain. Keep it positive. When things are tough, not going well, catch yourself making negative thoughts and statements and replace them with a positive thought or statement. And catching yourself in negative self-talk is always a good time to recite that phrase about letting go of what you don't have control over. Tip number six, find some personal time. Be deliberate in making time for yourself. Engage in activities that bring you joy. Maybe it's being alone or being with friends and family, calling someone, reading a book, being out in nature, taking a walk, listening to music, working on a craft, maybe taking a short nap. Do you take time for yourself? If not, why not? And how can you find more time for that in your day or your week? You may need to compromise and give yourself many chunks of personal time. You may need to combine a few, multitask and increase your efficiency like you could walk while listening to your webinar or watching your child's sporting game. We never have enough time in the day to do all that we want, but again, even small amounts can help. The final coping tip is stay connected. Those who have social connections are more likely to have better health outcomes, both physical and mental, and they are more resilient in facing life's setbacks and challenges. Social connections provide a sense of belonging with others. The number of others is not nearly as important as having that deep sense of connection and belonging. Research has showed that social connections lead to increased longevity, stronger gene expression for immunity, increased self-esteem and empathy, better emotion regulation, and lower rates of depression and anxiety. Now the pictures on the screen reflect social activities that you probably did pre-COVID. We have been challenged with needing to rethink and redo how we do our social connecting. However, we must do it. 
Our new normal, thanks to COVID, is to practice social distancing to help prevent the spread of the virus and keep people safe. Very important. The downside, however, has been that the restrictions and limitations have caused many to become socially isolated while they were practicing social distancing. Think about replacing the phrase social distancing with the phrase physical distancing. The purpose of social distancing is really to physically distance yourself, but the shift in wording will result in a shift toward maintaining social connections with others, even if you cannot be together physically. I challenge you to rethink and redo how you do your social connecting. Connecting with friends, loved ones in your community via social media, phone, video, text, letter writing are ever so important during the current times. Quiz time, oh, I mean review time. Can you now identify the seven general coping skills? Which are you accomplishing well? Which are your weak areas? Which areas will you add to your action plan today to feel better tomorrow? And here is an item for your action plan. I encourage you to reflect seriously on the following. Why are you doing the things that you know do not help you cope with stress? And why are you not doing the things that you know do help you? If you are looking for additional information to help you or a loved one coping with stress, we recommend you check with local healthcare providers along with these national sites, Be Well Indiana, SAMHSA, Mental Health America, and the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. And there's always your local Purdue Extension office. These sources were used for some of the information provided in this presentation. You can also take a free anonymous mental health screening online at Mental Health America. We have also compiled several handouts related to stress that you can access through the link on the screen or by contacting your local Purdue Extension office. Topics for the handouts include my coping strategy plan, creating healthy routines, supporting others, eliminating toxic influences, how stress affects you and your action plan, and more. So click on the link, write it down, bit.ly slash GTTD handouts. Pictures are worth a million words, and so it is time for me to thank the following photographers for the public use of their photos. All were found on unsplash.com. I also want to thank Eric Schmidt for the background music. And thank you for taking the time to learn more about your stress experience, causes, signs, and symptoms, and steps that you can take to manage your stress in a healthy way. Purdue University Extension's educational programs are provided to help make your lives better. Your feedback is helpful in improving our content and in obtaining funding to allow us to deliver our programs at no or low cost to the participants. We appreciate you taking a few minutes to complete a brief voluntary and anonymous survey on this presentation. You can pause the video now and jot down the access information. You can take the survey online or by phone. You can even right click and open the hyperlink right now. For additional information or any questions, I can be reached at the Purdue Extension Warwick County office at 812-897-6100 or through email. It has been my pleasure sharing this information with you. Be well.